because she might need to know about gravitational waves on Friday. It would help, right? We're supposed to do a topic following this on Thursday, following what we're gonna do today, but I can slide gravitational waves in this Thursday and hold that topic off till next week. That way you'll get introduced to gravitational waves this Thursday. Would that help? I mean, yeah, it would help me sound a little bit smarter than just doing astrophysics. Yeah, we'll do it, we'll do it. We'll do gravitational waves this Thursday. It's a one, it's a one lecture topic, okay. but yeah, so we'll do that. Um, so I'll change the topic. Well, I haven't put it up yet, but I'll change the topic for next week or for next Thursday. Also, um, I know I had your homework due this Thursday. I think I'm actually going to hang it. I'm, I'm going to hold off and have it due next Thursday because I'm just going to give you one more problem. And that's going to be the last homework problem of the semester. And I don't want to give you a quiz over the three I've given you and then give you a one question homework assignment. So you're going to have a total of four questions, but it'll be next, due next Thursday. And I'm going to have to rewrite my office hours tomorrow because I have to go to the doctor tomorrow at 4, which is usually in the middle of my, doctor, in my office hours. So I'll, I'll reconstruct my office hours this week and let you know when they're going to be. Okay. Well, it got weird last time, didn't it? You think it could get any weirder? Yeah, it will. <laughs> it can always get weirder. So what we're going to talk about today is initially what seems pretty dang innocent. But it turns out it really radically revolutionizes the story, okay? So, just a very quick uh, review. Um, originally, when we talked about black holes, we talked about the Schwarzschild black hole, and we first and foremost expressed it in Schwarzschild's coordinates, which I will write up uh, just for review. Comparison. Okay. Now remember, that is the metric outside of any spherically symmetric object, but it happens to turn out to also describe a black hole all the way down to r equals zero. However, there are better coordinates for crossing over the horizon. But nonetheless, we can kind of take this as the sort of canonical metric associated with a Schwarzschild black hole in Schwarzschild coordinates. Um, and an interesting observation about it is that uh, while GR was founded in about 1915, the Schwarzschild metric was founded about one year later. Okay? Yeah? Could the DR term be to the negative one? Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, you're right. I was so worried about getting the minus there and the plus there, I totally failed off the negative one. Thank you. Okay. Now, um, what we want to talk about today is basically taking this solution, which again describes a spherically symmetric distribution, which happens to be time independent. Okay. So it's a static solution. All right, stationary and static, in fact. Okay. What we want to do is we want to take this and spin it. Okay? So we just like to give it a little bit of a spin. All right? Now, there's a couple of things that we might expect upon spinning this. So, first and foremost, and you know, you can, you can, um, talk about the amount of spin in different ways. You can talk about the angular velocity, all this stuff, but basically what you can imagine is that you're giving the black hole some angular momentum, okay? So if you start off with a spherically symmetric black hole, the Schwarzschild, and you spin it, you basically pick an axis, a spatial axis, and you give it some angular momentum about that axis. So you give it some, uh, give it some J. We'll just say j phi for simplicity. Okay, now there's a couple of things that we can anticipate from what we're going to get. Um, first of all, uh, it will still be static. That is, if you spin it, if you just give it some angular momentum and let it go, it's going to just keep that angular momentum constant. So the, the solution will not change with time. So the solution will be static, 
but not stationary. Nick. Nick. Kiana. Kiana. This might be one of those days where the, can anyone online hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Can you okay. hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Thank you very much. Okay, let's try. Gus? I'm just gonna just bust through this set of cards. Sam! Wow. Sean! <laughs> Thank God. Sean. Um, so stationary means what? That it's not uh, stationary. Like it's frozen in space. Right? Well, that's kind of what static sort of implies is that it's not changing with time. But what's the difference between static and stationary? If you reverse the spin, it would be negative, right? Exactly. Okay. So it's stationary, which means that it's not t goes to minus t symmetric. Okay. Now, how do you get something which is station, which is static but not stationary? Okay, static means if you look at the metric, all of the functions do not depend on time. That's what it means to be time independent. So what do you expect for something which is not stationary, but is static? What could give rise to that? That would be like constant velocity type stuff, right? Nope. Close. So we're talking about the metric. We're not actually talking about velocities, per se. Constant derivative of the metric? No, it, it's just the form of the metric itself. So I want, I want it such that if I send t to minus t, the metric changes. A linear dependence on time? A linear dependence on time in what sense? I mean. It doesn't depend on time and the coefficients. Go. You want to have cross terms in the sense that you have t t multiplied by it. Exactly. So when we when we're writing down the metric, remember it's all these functions times the coordinate differentials. Normally we have d t squared. That's always in there. But and that's invariant under t goes to minus t, obviously. But if we had d t times some spatial component then since this is linear in dt, that's going to change sign under t goes to minus t. All of the rest of the functions in the metric are time independent, but you have to have the differential dt. And if you just have a linear dt term, then it's going to change sign. Okay? So what I'm saying is we can expect this in whatever metric is describing a spinning thing. Okay? Now, uh, here's another thing to expect. Um, <laughs> sorry, I just wanted to laugh along with them. Shut up, people. Spin axis. Um, so what we can do is, uh, we know we're going to spin it around an axis, and it's probably obvious that if we're going to choose an axis around which to spin it, then we can make things simpler by aligning our spherical polar coordinate system that we're going to start with in the right way, so that the polar axis goes through the axis about which it's spinning. Okay? So spin axis aligned with polar. We don't have to do that, but it obviously makes the picture much prettier when we do. But what we can then do is expect theta dependence. Okay? So remember in spherical polar coordinates, the angle theta is defined like that, the angle phi is defined like that. And so what we're saying is we're going to spin it around this axis, which we could just call the z-axis for simplicity. We're going to spin it around the z-axis, and what it's going to do if you imagine this, if you take a sphere and you spin it fast enough, it actually becomes a spheroid. If 
flattens out along the axis along which it's spinning and it bulges in order to let out. So that means that you get dependence and theta, but you still have phi independence. Okay, so you get theta dependence, of course you still have phi independence. Okay? And this is basically going to, in some sense, describe the squashing of the sphere. Okay? And any sphere that you do this with will, that's big enough will do this. You know, I mean, if, even a really rigid thing will do this to a microscopic level. But the Earth certainly is an oblate spheroid for its spinning. Yes? How do the singularities spin? Oh, I'm going to talk about that. Trust me. <laughs> It'll be interesting. That's, it's actually really, it's a good setup that you asked that. Because the answer to that is going to be really profound. Okay? But we'll get there. Okay, so um, after a little bit of soul searching and expecting these impacts in the answer, the answer was discovered. Okay, now it took a year to get the Schwarzschild metric. How long do you think it took to get the spinning metric? Anybody want to guess the year? Seven years. Seven years? 1963. But as you can imagine, what I'm about to write down is going to be ugly. Okay? So here we go. ds squared for a spinning sphere, which is often called the Kerr metric, K-E-R-R, -R, and it's written in Kerr coordinates. It is as follows, minus 1 minus 2 gm over, ha, I told you it's going to be so different. Actually, it is. So over rho squared, dt squared, minus 2 g m a r sine squared theta over rho squared times 2 d phi dt plus rho squared over delta dr squared plus rho squared d theta squared. I'm not even close to that. Plus sine squared theta over rho squared times r squared plus a squared squared minus a squared delta sine squared theta d phi squared. Is that as bad as you thought it was? He almost waited for mathematical. No, I'm kidding. He didn't use a computer to find it. Okay, so, actually, sorry, I call these care coordinates, and they're not actually care coordinates. Uh, it's the care solution, but the coordinates that he's using are called the Boyer-Lindquist coordinates. Now, looking at that solution, you should realize there's some things I have to define for you. Okay, what's rho, what's, what's delta, what's A? So it turns out that A is simply the ratio of the angular momentum, which is angular momentum associated with rotations in the phi plane. So it's the ratio of the angular momentum to the total mass of the system. Delta, which is a function of R, is R squared minus 2GM times r plus a squared. And then rho squared, which is a function of both r and theta, is r squared plus a squared cosine squared theta. Okay? Now, as promised, are you ready? D phi dt. That keeps it from being stationary. Because if we change the time to minus time, this term is going to pick up a 
a different sign. Okay? Also, state independence. Clearly, there's state independence. Okay? And this goes above and beyond the usual theta dependence. You know, the sine squared theta dp squared, that's the standard term in spherical polar. But this is obviously got a lot more non trivial theta dependence. Okay? Now, before we go on to explore this thing, let's just make a few hopefully obvious observations. First and foremost, for A goes to zero, what does this become? Anyone? If A goes to zero, delta becomes R squared minus two GMR, A is zero, and this just becomes R squared. If A is zero, this whole term disappears. This just becomes Ooh, 1 minus 2 GMR. What does it become? The Schwarzschild. Okay. So A is the parameter which is largely kept. Yes? So if it becomes the Schwarzschild matrix of a different coordinate, does that matter? It becomes the Schwarzschild metric in different coordinates. What do you mean? Yeah, so um, there is certainly a sense in which this is basically built out of the Schwarzschild coordinates but extended to the care geometry. But you don't really want to give them the name Schwarzschild coordinates. So they're, they're called the boyer lindquist but the boyer lindquist do reduce to Schwarzschild when you take the limit that A goes to zero. Right. So yeah, yeah, you're right. We don't actually have to do any re coordinate redefinitions when we take this limit. And you can see this will reduce to this if I take a to zero. Does everybody see that? I mean, if you don't look at the whole thing, just look at a few terms and you'll realize it just reduces to that. Okay? All right. Um, for r goes to infinity, for r goes to infinity, what does it become? Yeah, it becomes flat space. It becomes Minkowski space, but in spherical polar coordinates. So it's minus dt squared plus dr squared plus r squared d omega squared. Okay? All right. So at least we know the limits of this make sense. There's one more limit that I would talk about, but we're, we're kind of you know, getting a little bit behind, so I won't worry about that. But it's essentially taking the mass to zero and keeping A fixed, which if you think about it's a bit weird. Okay? But it turns out if we want to keep A fixed and take the mass to zero, okay, then the limit of L phi is going to zero, and in the end it actually gives us back flat space but it's giving us back flat space in a strange coordinate system, okay? All right, so what we want to do is we want to go ahead and identify the problems with this coordinate system and this metric, okay? So, Jared, Jared. I'm just going to start picking who. Paul! I'm assuming that one. I'm going to get the one on the, the screen. Paul! Yeah, I'm fine. Sorry. That's okay. Paul! <laughs> Paul! Uh, for what values of rho and delta do you think this thing's going to have some problems? Zero? Yes, yes. When rho is zero, uh, let me see. When rho is zero, and or 
when delta is equal to zero, we have some potential problems because obviously this is blowing up, this is blowing up, this is blowing up, okay? Now, hopefully we learned from the Schwarzschild solution that just because something is going to infinity in the metric, that doesn't necessarily mean that things are going singular. If it's not going singular, but stuff screwing up in the metric, then we are experiencing what's called a, it rhymes with coordinate singularity. A coordinate singularity, yes, very good. You're very good at the rhyming. You should be a poet and you know it because you rhyme all the time. Okay. Uh, so, so we should ask whether rho goes to zero or delta is equal to zero is a coordinate singularity or if it's true singularity. All right, well, first and foremost, rho equals zero is a true singularity. All right? Rho equals zero is a true singularity. But it turns out a very, very interesting one. And then we'll come back and we'll talk about rho equals zero. So, remember, rho squared is defined as r squared plus a squared cosine squared theta. Okay? Now, a is fixed. A is not a function. A is just how much angular momentum with respect to mass we're giving this thing. So just imagine a is a constant, non-zero. These, of course, are functions of where you are. Okay? So for rho squared, or rho to be zero, what does r have to be? Third negative. So these are all squares. So if rho is zero, this is zero equals r squared plus a squared cosine squared theta. So what does r have to be? Now, r squared can't be negative anything. Yeah. It's got to be zero. So r is equal to zero. Is that the only thing we need? What else do we need? This term is now zero. What about this term? Well, this is not zero. A is a fixed constant, so we need this to be zero. So what does theta have to be? Theta has to be pi over 2. Okay? Well, that's kind of interesting. Because normally, when we're dealing with, you know, polar coordinates and the singularity is at r equals 0, it's at r equals 0. It doesn't matter what any of the other coordinates are. However, this thing is not blowing up when r is equal to 0. It's blowing up when rho is equal to zero. And it turns out that rho is equal to zero is a true singularity. Okay? Now, if I say this, you should ask me, how do you know that? And the truth is, we have a, uh, we have a scalar curvature which blows up. So remember I said, how do you figure out whether something is a singularity or not, well, you take the curvature, so you start with the Riemann curvature tensor, and then you can form the Ricci tensor, you can form the Ricci scalar, but anyway, you take those, and you just form all the scalars you can imagine out of them. And if all of those scalars you can imagine are all zero, then the space does not have an, a, a singularity. However, if any of them are blowing up, well, they're scalar, curvature invariance. So if it blows up, it'll blow up in any coordinate system. So it's a true singularity. And so it turns out there is one which blows up when rho is equal to zero. Okay? Now, as I was pointing out, rho equals zero actually implies these two things. Now we're going to start with r equals zero, and then we'll come back to rho equals zero. But it turns out that r equals zero is super interesting. Okay? So, in order to understand this, uh, let's do this. Let's take the metric and evaluate it at r equals zero. Okay? Now, metric at r equals zero. Hold on just 
Sorry, I am a little bit confused. So when I set r equals to zero, Okay, maybe you can help me. For some reason, I have minus dt squared, and it is not obvious how setting r equals to zero is giving me that this is just minus one. Should that be a row squared in that term? Because if you take a goes to zero. Wait, row squared in what term? In the dt squared. Here? Yeah, should that, because if you take uh, if you take a goes to zero and plug in row squared equals r squared, you don't get the squared style. You get two gm over r squared instead of two gm over and that's been bothering me for like 10 minutes. Uh, hang on. There should be real squared in every other term. Anybody have access to yeah? Yeah, online it looks like an attribute is R on top. Sorry, so you know. Oh shoot, that's that's it. Sorry about that. That's two GMR. That solved everything. <laughs> I had it written in my notes very tiny and I missed it. So thank you. Yeah, I think I didn't have it in the original version, and then I was like, oh shit, I need an R and I put it in super tiny to the point where I couldn't see it. So thank you for that. Okay, now we realize if r is equal to zero, then this is just minus dt squared. Okay, carrying on. Then we have plus a cosine theta d theta squared plus a sine squared theta or sine theta squared dt squared. So if I call this dr twiddle squared, then this would become r twiddle squared d phi squared. Okay? Where r twiddle is just a sine of theta. Okay? Now theta lives from zero to pi. So this means that our twiddle lives from zero to a. Huh. Okay, screw this, this is complicated. Let's just take a simpler example. Let's take the Minkowski metric in spherical polar coordinates. And now let's ask, what happens to this at r equals zero? Come on, okay, 
what happens to this term? Zero. What happens to this term? Zero. No, it's zero because if you're at r equals zero, then you're not changing the value of r. So this literally becomes minus dt squared. This is literally a point-like movement along dt squared, or dt, okay? This, however, at the point r equals zero, involves motion in t, theta, and phi. But the motion in theta and phi actually looks more like a radius, which goes from zero to a, and then a radius coupled with an angle term. So this thing is actually a one plus two dimensional volume, okay? Where the t-axis runs up the middle, and then we have the r-coordinate, and then we have the phi-coordinate. I just want you to realize, in the norm, r equals zero was a point that moved through time. This is a disk, solid disk, which moves through time. Very different. Okay? Does that make sense to everybody? So this guy. t-axis and a point moving along the t-axis. This are these disks moving up the t-axis. Now are you ready? I hope you guys are ready. R equals zero is not the singularity. Where's the singularity? Where's the singularity? Come on, guys, say something. R total equals zero? Well, well, so it's at R total equals theta equals pi over two. Sine of pi over two is, so A, or R total is A. So from this picture, what is the singularity? It's a disk. No, it's not a disk. Oh, a ring, sorry. Yes, it is the ring at r total equals a that goes up in time. from the r equals zero singularity of a Schwarzschild black hole. Okay? Now, a couple of very, very important points. Number one, did you expect this? I've heard regular, I guess, so I was wondering if it was gonna somehow come up, but. Yeah. Well, think about it this way. With a Schwarzschild black hole, how many parameters define the black hole? One. What is it? Well, it's the radius, but it's also the, it's either the radius or the, and it's the radius of what, by the way? Not the singularity, because its radius is zero. It's the radius of the event horizon, and that is directly related to what quantity? The map, look, folks, when you make a Schwarzschild black hole, there's only one parameter in it, it's M. G is the universal gravitational constant. M is the yes. only parameter in this. Okay? Well, it turns out that the singularity being point-like is fine. Okay? However, the pair black hole is defined by how many different quantities. 
And don't look at the equations, just think about what you're doing. You're taking a black hole with some mass m, and you're giving it a spin. So how many quantities? Two. Two. We should not expect the singularity to look just like the singularity of a normal black hole. The singularity should in some way reflect, oh, you're giving me this other parameter. And this is how it's encoding it. The singularity is actually stretching out into a ring, the radius of which depends on how much you're spinning the black hole. In fact, if you reduce the spinning of the black hole to zero, then rho goes to zero is equal to r goes to zero, and you just reduce back to this case. Okay? That's the first really interesting point. This is just encoding that our solution depends on two parameters. And this is reflecting that geometrically. Now are you ready for the awesome one? Go ahead, pass. So if you could hit the singularity before actually hitting the center of the black hole technically, if the ring stretches out further than Well, the let me actually just say this, because this is the most awesome point of the black hole, of the spinning black hole. You can go through the ring without touching the singularity. It's a ring, right? It's only singular on the ring. It's not singular at r equals zero. At r equals zero, when theta is not pi over two, rho is not zero, so it's not singular. Okay? So in this picture, we have singular, not singular. which means you can pass through the center of a ring of singularity without touching the singularity. Now, don't get me wrong. You might be like, well, wait a minute. You're going to be drawn to the singularity, and you're going to be crushed in the singularity. We'll get to that in a minute. OK? All right. Are there any questions about this? Yeah. If the angle of theta is not well defined at r equals zero? In other words, like, if you're passing through r equals zero, how do you know that you're passing through r equals zero at theta equals zero as opposed to theta equals five or two? Oh, no, no, no. This is definitely not the metric of spherical polar coordinates. You can take r equals to zero, and theta is still well defined. Okay. Yeah. I mean, normally, you have r squared sine squared theta dp squared. Okay, and if you're at r equals zero, that term disappears, and then you have r squared d theta squared, okay? But notice, I can take r to zero, rho squared is still a squared cosine squared theta, this term is non-trivial, so I can move in theta. This is just a very, very different beast than good old spherical polar coordinates in flat space, okay? Now, you might have guessed that the angular momentum was somehow tied to the intrinsic spin of the black hole, but intrinsic spin is that's quantum mechanical. This is not quantum mechanical. This is just taking something and rotating it. Now, I should say, you might ask, how rare is this? How rare is a black hole of this form? What do you think? You can expect them all to be really, really rare. Exactly. Everything out in space is spinning. Even maybe just a little bit, but actually quite a bit. Yeah, I mean, everything has got angular momentum, and then it collides and it absorbs things, and it's, got, it's spinning. And when it collapses, it's going to collapse to this. It's a good approximation to take the Schwarzschild, just the same as it's a good approximation to take the Schwarzschild for a planet or a star. Okay, But this is clearly a very important metric. All right? OK, so we've got a ring singularity that I claim we can go through without getting fried. Now let's talk about delta e. Oh yeah, go ahead. I was ask, what's the interpretation of the radius of the, like what are you going, is there like a spatial component there on the x-axis? Like, sure. Okay, yeah. so it is a little, okay. Yeah. Look, uh, there's a certain sense in which you've gotta just get away 
from your R's beta phi interpretation of this geometry. It's obviously way more complicated. I mean, for instance, R equals zero is, not, is no longer a spatial point, it's a ring. Forget about the time evolution for a moment because dt squared just comes along for the ride and everything translates up along t. Just think of spatial. In three spatial dimensions, with r theta phi, r equals zero is a point. In this story, r equals zero is a ring. Okay? Gotta trust it. All right. So now what we want to do, and we'll come back to that ring singularity in a few minutes, but now we want to address the rho equals zero case. And the rho equals zero case turns out to be very interesting as well. So for the rho, for the delta, sorry, I keep saying rho, the delta equals zero case, this is not a curvature singularity. Okay? In fact, this is going to be a singularity in the same way that r equals 2gm was a singularity here. It's a coordinate singularity, and it actually indicates the presence of a horizon. Okay? Now, let me actually show you something really quick and dirty, which we did not talk about in the Schwarzschild, but which we're going to use here. Okay? And that is the following. For the Schwarzschild black hole, we know that we have r equals 2gm as the radius of the horizon. When you're outside of the black hole, you can move inwards or you can move outwards. But when you're inside the black hole, you can only move inwards. Okay? Here's a quick and dirty way to see that from the Schwarzschild metric. If you're outside of the black hole and you want to think about radial motion, you look at this coefficient and you ask yourself, is this coefficient positive or negative? If r is bigger than 2gm. Positive. It's positive, okay? What happens when we move inside of the horizon to this coefficient? Negative. It's negative. What happens to this coefficient? Positive. positive. So hopefully you kind of get the sense that once you're inside of a Schwarzschild horizon, your radial motion behaves more like time. But remember, things can only evolve in time in one direction. So this is a way of just, and don't, don't, don't then ask me what happens when time becomes radial, don't worry about that. But what's key is, if we just focus on the radial term, as long as the coefficient in front of it is positive, you can move away or towards, because it's a purely spatial direction. But when this term becomes negative, that's what makes it behave more like time, in which case you can only move in one direction. Now, I'm saying that to you because we're about to use it extensively. All right, but does everybody kind of understand that? It's just a sort of a heuristic. Okay, so with that in mind, first and foremost, what we should realize is that delta, which is r squared minus 2gm r plus a squared, when this is zero, how many solutions are we going to have? Are we going to have a horizon? of this thing? Do we have two horizons? You'll have two. It's quadratic. We'll have two. I mean, generally we'll have two. Okay? So, it turns out that we can call these the plus and minus, and they take the form gm plus or minus the square root of g squared m squared minus a squared. Folks, we have two horizons at different values of r. Weird. Okay? Not only does our singularity blow up,
but our horizons bifurcate. Okay? Now, once again, if we use this trick, we can now explore what happens as we move inside of these horizons. So let's look at a few cases. First and foremost, let's look at the A equals zero case. If A is equal to zero, what is R minus? Zero. It's zero. What is R plus? TGM. TGM. What case are we dealing with if A is zero? Yeah, we're dealing with the Schwarzschild. This becomes the Schwarzschild singularity, and this becomes the Schwarzschild horizon. And just to draw a picture, which is going to be very similar to the picture I did over there, but I'm going to draw it up here, we have the horizon, we have r equals zero. If we're inside, we have delta less than zero, so that means you can only move inwards. And if you're outside, you have deltas greater than zero, which means you can move in and out. Okay? Notice, the sign of delta is what is determining the sign in front of the dr squared term. This is what I was saying we need to look at to figure out whether you can move in or out or just in. Well, the sign of this coefficient is determined by the sign of delta, because rho is squared. So if all you want to know about is the sign, you just need to know about delta, okay? So when delta is positive, you can move in and out. When delta is negative, you can move. So this is just the Schwarzschild scenario in this language, because now we're going to extend it. So now let's consider the case where a squared is less than g squared m squared, okay? So now we can imagine taking an a dial and turning it up from zero up. Okay, obviously something might happen when a squared equals g squared m squared. Okay, but for now, we're gonna keep it less. And if you keep it less, then we are dealing with what is called the sub-extremal. And that'll be well defined in just a moment. In this case, we have that r plus is greater than r minus, which is greater than zero, okay? So in this case, what we find is the following. We find two horizons, okay? Remember, the horizons are not gonna be spherically symmetric anymore. They're gonna have theta dependence because this thing is spinning. So these are oblate spheroids. Okay, so you can fix the value of r, but the metric is telling you that even if you fix the value of r, the shape is going to change as you change theta, okay? So we've got r plus and r minus. Moreover, we have r equals zero, which is now a ring, okay? And I'm collapsing everything into two dimensions. So the ring comes out like this. These come out like this, okay? Now, if we're outside, then delta is greater than zero. That means that I can move either way. Yeah, I can go in or I can go out. When I pass through R plus, but I'm greater than R minus, in this situation, delta becomes less than zero. What does this mean? I can only move in. Okay? When I get in this region, delta is now greater than zero. Which means what? I can move in or out. Now hopefully that just answered your question of, are you drawn to the singularity? Do you have to go into it? The answer is no. You can actually go in here and look at the singularity and then leave. 
pretty sweet, huh? Now here's an interesting question. If I leave, I'm back here. Does this mean I have to turn around and come back in? The answer is no. What this is telling me is that whatever path of motion I'm on, I must continue. I enter from the outside going radial, radially in, and I can't turn around. If I turn around in here and enter this region moving radially out, that means that I must move radially out. I can't turn myself around. Now that might seem weird. If you come in from the outside, you've got to go in. If you're leaving from the inside, you've got to go out. I mean, what, you know, what's this guy going to say to this guy? He's bugging, fly. We'll understand this in a moment. Okay, trust me. And it will be crazy. It'll truly, truly be crazy. But for now, this is the picture. If you're outside of it, you can leave or enter. Once you enter, you've got to move from R plus to R minus. No choice. But once you're in here, you can float around, take pictures, go through the ring, have somebody take your picture as you go through the ring. And then if you want to leave, you can re-enter here, in which case you'll get ejected back out. Okay? There will be a catch to that story in a few minutes. But before we go there, let's continue with our cases. We have the extremal case. In the extremal case, what we have is that R plus is equal to R minus, which is equal to GM. Okay? In this case, our solution looks like this. Are you ready? Out here, delta is greater than zero. So you can travel towards or you can travel away, okay? Once you cross the horizon though, delta is still greater than zero, which means you can travel either way. Who the hell wants to call that an event horizon? You can pass through it and then turn around and go back out. Is that the definition of an event horizon? It's gonna turn out to be, for reasons that will blow your mind. But we'll get there, okay? Last but not least, there is a squared greater than b squared m squared. This is an over extreme black hole. with no horizon. Okay? In this case, there is no delta equals zero. So this constitutes what we call a naked singularity. And we'll talk about this in the future. That is, this is a singularity in curvature which is not cloaked behind an event horizon in any way, shape, or form. Okay? It turns out these are illegal. But we'll say more about that later. Okay? But these, this is the extremal case, these at least are allowed. Okay? So, in order to understand what all this means, you might could imagine that we should go ahead and skip to the maximal aspect of this story. That is, we should maximally extend this geometry, just like we did with the Schwarzschild black hole. Because remember with the Schwarzschild black hole, we ended up with a horizon, a singularity, another external copy of M4, a white hole, we ended up with all that stuff. Well, let's see what that's going to look like in this case. Now, I could do something very similar to what I did with the Schwarzschild story, but we're actually going to skip ahead and we're going to go to one more powerful version. Okay? And 
I'm going to erase this. I'm sure I'm going to regret it later. But here we go. We are going to, so, uh, you know, I don't know if you remember, but um, so, so in our, in our uh, cross-call coordinate uh, picture of the geometry for the black hole, we had r equals zero, we had r equals zero, we had r equals two gm. And t equals infinity, r equals 2gm, and t equals minus infinity. Okay? And then we have here a copy of m4, and here we have another copy of m4. Okay? And then the nice thing about this was the light cones opened up at 45 degrees everywhere. So this makes it immediately obvious where you can and can't go. If you're here, you can go out, you can go towards, but once you're in here, you can only go towards r equals zero. If you're here, you can only leave, but once you leave, you can go back and forth, okay? What's disappointing about this, which you might think, ah, oh, it's not that disappointing, is that R equals infinity is way the fuck over there. Sorry, pardon my French. It's way over there, okay? And it's way over here. What we would like to do is to grab it and draw it in. Because then we're actually drawing the complete diagram of space-time. If we can just put infinity at a finite distance. And to do this, we're going to use what is called the conformal or Penrose, and I'm sure many of you have heard of that name, diagram. Okay? So this is basically going to be not just a coordinate transformation, but it's going to be a coordinate transformation to a conformally related geometry, and I'll explain what that means in just a moment. Okay, so let me go ahead and give you the coordinate transformation that we're going to use. And uh, I am going to start off... Okay, so I am going to start off... Let me, let me actually come down a little bit. I'm going to start off by applying this to M4, which of course is minus dt squared plus dr squared plus r squared d omega squared, okay, with t, r, theta, and phi. I'm going to first apply this process to M4, and then we'll apply it to the other metrics, okay? So what are we going to do? We're going to take t is the inverse tangent of t plus r plus the inverse tangent of t minus r. And then we're going to take as our new coordinate capital R the inverse tangent of t plus r minus the inverse tangent of t minus r. Okay? Now hopefully you remember that inverse tangents are nice ways to take infinity and pull it into a finite value. Right? Because if you feed tangent of theta at a certain angle, it gives you infinity. Well, the inverse tangent just grabs infinity and brings it back. Make sense? Okay, so let's look at the restrictions that this implies. First of all, the magnitude of t must always be less than pi minus r. Okay? And then r is constrained to be greater than, greater than or equal to zero and less than pi, okay? This is, of course, based on taking the normal values of t and r, because remember, t lives on minus infinity to infinity, and r lives on zero to infinity. So this is just saying, plugging in the ranges here into these definitions gives you these ranges. These are both finite. I mean, t has got to be less than pi minus big R, but R is just restricted to go from zero to pi. Okay, so these are finite. 
So hopefully you can see that we took the infinite and we've made it finite. Okay, and that's what inverse tangent functions will do for you. Okay, now in terms of these coordinates, ds squared will take the following form. One over cosine t plus cosine r squared minus dt squared plus dr squared plus sine squared r d omega squared. Okay? Now, here's an important observation. Capital R is acting like an angle. I mean, think about it. That's usually the angular part of spherical pole of coordinates. Okay, and R has this range. So R in this case is actually acting more like an angle. Moreover, this can be written as one over omega squared of t and r times ds total squared, where this thing right here is ds total squared, okay? And now I want to make an observation. ds squared is one geometry, ds twiddle squared is a different geometry. Because to get the ds squared, you have to multiply by one over omega squared. Everybody on board? So I'll stress one more time. ds squared is different from ds twiddle squared. However, they are conformally related. Now can anybody give me a definition of a conformal relation? Oh, can I try? I think I got, are you gonna try? No. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so um, a conformal relationship essentially is when you multiply the metric by scalar function. Yes, but what does that do? It preserves angles, but it changes lengths. Exactly. So a conformal mapping can change the length of things because this certainly plays a role in the length, but it cannot change the angle between things. Okay? Because if you think about it, the angle between things is the ratio of dr to d phi or dt to d phi or whatever. But this is overall multiplied by this. So those ratios are going to be the same. Okay. This is important because if we're working with a geometry where all of the light cones open at 45 degrees, then in a conformally related geometry, all of the light cones still open up at 45 degrees. And that's a huge advantage that we've gotten out of you know, a lot of these coordinate systems. Okay, so to visualize what this is going to look like, I am totally out of room. Okay, uh, well we got these pictures, so I guess we can just delete this. All right. So, to visualize, what we can say is the following, and I'm just gonna draw a picture. Um, so R is acting like an angle, so we can imagine that our geometry kind of lives on the surface of a can, okay, where T goes this way, and R is an angle, okay? But now remember though, that R does not go from zero to two pi, okay? And T is also limited. So it's not the entire surface of this thing. I mean, I'm looking at the R and T part of this story, so I'm drawing a two-dimensional surface, but I'm arguing it's not the entire surface of this infinite cylinder, it's rather a finite range, and it turns out this is the labeling. So if we call this point R equals zero, 
and of course this point r equals pi, then we have the following. So this point we could call t equals minus pi, r equals zero. This point we could call t equals pi, r equals zero. And then this point we would call t equals zero, r equals pi. And then we live in the range of t that satisfies this and r that satisfies this. So what that means is that we live, I, I have a hard time drawing this, so just wrap your mind around it for a moment. It's a diamond, one end of which is here, and then it's rolled around the cylinder and the tip sits there. So that's what these lines are trying to imply to you. Okay, it's hard to draw. Does that make sense? Okay, so this surface, following these constraints, lives along this diamond. It does not include the rest of this cylinder. And it's chopped off. It stops here and here. It doesn't go above or below. Okay? So now what we can do is we can just unwrap this and lay it flat. So if we do that, then this is what we end up with. constant lines. So if I take t to be constant, then it's one of these lines that go like this. Okay? The r equals constant lines are like this. Okay? Clearly this particular version of the r constant is r equals zero, and this is t equals zero. All right? Now, I just want you to notice, t equals infinity is on this. It's that point right there. Because as I take t to infinity, I'm just going to come closer and closer to this line. And t equals minus infinity is on here. Okay? r equals zero is on here, and so is r equals infinity. So I've grabbed all of my infinities in t and r, and I've drugged them in to a finite distance. This triangle represents the entirety of the space-time, which is conformally related to the original space-time. Okay? Now, what is, of course, glorious about that conformal relation is I know the direction in which light cones open up. They open up at 45 degrees. Okay? Now, I've labeled I plus, I zero, I minus, J plus, J minus. These have definitions. I plus and I minus. This is the time-like future infinity. And this is the time-like past infinity. Okay? I zero is the space-like infinity. J plus is the future null infinity, and j minus is the past null infinity. Now let's see if we can give those an interpretation. I plus is the future time-like infinity. What does that mean? Well, 
Well, what follows a time-like path? Do you remember? Well, let me ask you a question. Do you think you can get here traveling inside of a light cone? I mean, here's a light cone. Can you get to there? Yeah. Time-like is the path which massive objects follow. So I plus is basically where any path that a massive object is going will eventually end up. It's infinitely far away, but it's finite on this diagram. So all massive objects must end there, and they must begin there. Remember, you know, if you're a massive object and you live, you know, 65 years, you begin and end, but these paths through space-time, they can be continued infinitely from t equals minus infinity to plus infinity, okay? So this is where any massive object, that's where its path will end if it evolves infinitely. This is where it came from if we infinitely did it back, okay? Now, these lines are where light will eventually end or begin. That's what we mean by future null and past null. Light travels along null paths. The word null might seem weird, but remember ds squared for light is zero, it's null. And then last but not least, I zero is space-like. This is the infinity that can't be gotten to by anything, either light or something that has mass. Something tachyonic could get there if it existed. Okay? Now, this is the story of a conformal Penrose diagram for Minkowski space. That is, of course, not where we want to take it. We want to take it to black holes. Okay, so I have a choice now. We are on the ending, and I have two very important pages to tell you. Should we finish this, or should we push it until next week? Who thinks we should finish it? Who thinks we should push it till next week? How about you guys online? Should we finish it or push it till next week? I got no, re got no response. Um, I'd, like, I'd like to finish it for one, but it's what everybody else wants. Folks? How long will it take? Uh, it take about ten minutes. <laughs> we can we can argue about this for ten minutes. No, let's just get through it in ten minutes. I'll finish it next time. I'll finish it at the beginning of the next lecture, and then we'll go on to gravitational waves because I don't want to keep you guys any longer than necessary. All right. So well, we have something exciting to look forward to at the beginning of the next lecture. Trust me. Want me to stop this? Yeah.